This transaction fixed Ralph in his resolution of becoming a poet. I did all I could to dissuade him from it, but he continued scribbling verses till Pope cured him. He became, however, a pretty good prose writer. More of him hereafter. But, as I may not have occasion again to mention the other two, I shall just remark here that Watson died in my arms a few years after, much lamented, being the best of our set. Osborne went to the West Indies, where he became an eminent lawyer and made money, but died young. He and I had made a serious agreement that the one who happened to die first should, if possible, make a friendly visit to the other and acquaint him how he found things in that separate state but he never fulfilled his promise. The governor, seeming to like my company, had me frequently to his house, and his setting me up was always mentioned as a fixed thing. I was to take with me letters recommendatory to a number of his friends, besides the letter of credit, to furnish me with the necessary money for purchasing the press and types, paper, etc. For these letters I was appointed to call at different times when they were to be ready, but a future time was still named. Thus he went on till the ship, whose departure, too, had been several times postponed, was on the point of sailing. Then, when I called to take my leave and receive the letters, his secretary, Dr. Bard, came out to me and said the governor was extremely busy in writing, but would be down at Newcastle before the ship, and there the letters would be delivered to me. Ralph, though married and having one child, had determined to accompany me in this voyage. It was thought he intended to establish a correspondence and obtain goods to sell on commission, but I found afterwards that through some discontent with his wife's relations, he proposed to leave her on their hands and never return again. Having taken leave of my friends and interchanged some promises with Miss Reed, I left Philadelphia in the ship, which anchored at Newcastle. The governor was there, but when I went to his lodging, the secretary came to me from him, with the civilest message in the world, that he could not then see me, being engaged in business of the utmost importance, but should send the letters to me on board, wished me a heartily good voyage and a speedy return, etc. I returned on board, a little puzzled, but still not doubting. Mr. Andrew Hamilton, a famous lawyer of Philadelphia, had taken passage in the same ship for himself and son, and with Mr. Denham, a Quaker merchant, and Messrs. Onion and Russell had engaged the great cabin, so that Ralph and I were forced to take up a berth in the steerage, and none on board knowing us were considered as ordinary persons. But Mr. Hamilton and his son, it was James, since governor, returned from Newcastle to Philadelphia, the father being recalled by a great fee to plead for a seized ship, and, just before we sailed, Colonel French coming on board and showing me great respect, I was more taken notice of, and, with my friend Ralph, invited by the other gentleman to come into the cabin, there being now room. Accordingly, we removed thither, understanding that Colonel French had brought on board the governor's dispatches. I'd asked the captain for those letters that were to be under my care. He said all were put into the bag together, and he could not then come at them, but before we landed in England I should have an opportunity of picking them out, so I was satisfied for the present, and we proceeded on our voyage. We had a sociable company in the cabin, and lived uncommonly well, having the addition of all Mr. Hamilton's stores, who had laid in plentifully. In this passage, Mr. Denham contracted a friendship for me that continued during his life. The voyage was otherwise not a pleasant one, as we had a great deal of bad weather. When we came into the channel, the captain kept his word with me and gave me an opportunity of examining the bag for the governor's letters. I found none upon which my name was put under my care. I picked out six or seven that, by the handwriting, I thought might be the promised letters, especially as one of them was directed to Basket, the king's printer, and another to some stationer. We arrived in London the 24th of December, 1724. I waited upon the stationer who came first in my way delivering the letter as from Governor Keith. I don't know such a person, says he, but opening the letter, oh, this is from Riddleston. I have lately found him to be a complete rascal, and I will have nothing to do with him nor receive any letters from him. 
So, putting the letter into my hand, he turned on his heel and left me to serve some customer. I was surprised to find these were not the governor's letters, and, after recollecting and comparing circumstances, I began to doubt his sincerity. I found my friend Denham and opened the whole affair to him. He let me into Keith's character, told me there was not the least probability that he had written any letters for me, that no one who knew him had the smallest dependence on him, and he laughed at the notion of the governor's giving me a letter of credit having, as he said, no credit to give. On my expressing some concern about what I should do, he advised me to endeavor getting some employment in the way of my business. Among the printers here, he said, you will improve yourself, and when you return to America you will set up to greater advantage. We both of us happened to know, as well as the stationer, that Riddlesden, the attorney, was very knave. He had half ruined Miss Reed's father by persuading him to be bound for him. By this letter, it appeared, there was a secret scheme on foot to the prejudice of Hamilton, supposed to be then coming over with us, and that Keith was concerned in it with Riddlesden. Denham, who was a friend of Hamilton's, thought he ought to be acquainted with it, so, when he arrived in England, I waited on him and gave him the letter. He thanked me cordially, the information being of importance to him, and from that time he became my friend, greatly to my advantage afterwards on many occasions. But what shall we think of a governor's playing such pitiful tricks and imposing so grossly on a poor ignorant boy? It was a habit he had acquired. He wished to please everybody, and, having little to give, he gave expectations. He was otherwise an ingenious, sensible man, a pretty good writer, and a good governor for the people, though not for his constituents the proprietaries whose instructions he sometimes disregarded. Ralph and I were inseparable companions. We took lodgings together in Little Britain at three shillings and sixpence a week, as much as we could then afford. He found some relations, but they were poor and unable to assist him. He now let me know his intentions of remaining in London and that he never meant to return to Philadelphia. He had brought no money with him, the whole he could muster having been expended in paying his passage. I had fifteen pistoles, so he borrowed occasionally of me to subsist whilst he was looking out for business. He first endeavored to get into the playhouse, believing himself qualified for an actor, but Wilkes, to whom he had applied, advised him candidly not to think of that employment, as it was impossible he should succeed in it. Then he proposed to Roberts, a publisher in Paternoster Row, to write for him a weekly paper on certain conditions which Robert did not approve. Then he endeavored to get employment as a hackney writer to copy for the stationers and lawyers about the temple, but could find no vacancies. I immediately got into work at Palmer's, then a famous printing house in Bartholomew Close, and here I continued near a year. I was pretty diligent, but spent with Ralph a good deal of my earnings in going to plays and other places of amusement. We had together consumed all of my pistoles, and now just rubbed on from hand to mouth. He seemed quite to forget his wife and child, and I, by degrees, my engagements with Miss Reed, to whom I never wrote more than one letter, and that was to let her know I was not likely soon to return. This was another of the great errata of my life, which I should wish to correct if I were to live it over again. In fact, by our expenses, I was constantly kept unable to pay my passage. At Palmer's, I was employed in composing for the second edition of Wollaston's Religion of Nature. Some of his reasonings not appearing to me well-founded, I wrote a little metaphysical piece in which I made remarks on them. It was entitled, a dissertation on liberty and necessity, pleasure and pain. I inscribed it to my friend Ralph. I printed a small number. It occasioned my being more considered by Mr. Palmer as a young man of some ingenuity, though he seriously expostulated with me upon the principles of my pamphlet, which to him appeared abominable. My printing this pamphlet was another erratum. While I lodged in Little Britain, I made an acquaintance with one Wilcox, a bookseller, whose shop was at the next door. He had an immense collection of second-hand books. Circulating libraries were not then in use, but we agreed that, on certain reasonable terms, which I have now forgotten, I might take, read, and return any of his books. 
This I esteemed a great advantage, and I made as much use of it as I could. My pamphlet, by some means falling into the hands of one Lyons, a surgeon, author of a book entitled The Infallibility of Human Judgment, it occasioned an acquaintance between us. He took great notice of me, called on me often to converse on those subjects, carried me to the Horns, a pale alehouse, and introduced me to Dr. Mandeville, author of The Fable of the Bees, who had a club there, of which he was the soul, being a most facetious, entertaining companion. Lyons, too, introduced me to Dr. Pemberton at Batson's Coffee House, who promised to give me an opportunity, some time or other, of seeing Sir Isaac Newton, of which I was extremely desirous, but this never happened. I had brought over a few curiosities, among which the principal was a purse made of the asbestos, which purifies by fire. Sir Hans Sloane heard of it, came to see me, and invited me to his house in Bloomsbury Square, where he showed me all his curiosities, and persuaded me to let him add to that the number for which he paid me handsomely. In our house there lodged a young woman, a milliner, who I think had a shop in the cloisters. She had been genteely bred, was sensible and lively, and of most pleasing conversation. Ralph read plays to her in the evenings. They grew intimate. She took another lodging, and he followed her. They lived together for some time, but he, being still out of business, and her income not sufficient to maintain them with her child, he took a resolution of going from London to try for a country school, which he thought himself well qualified to undertake, as he wrote an excellent hand, and was a master of arithmetic and accounts. This, however, he deemed a business below him, and confident of future better fortune, he changed his name, and did me the honor to assume mine for I soon after had a letter from him acquainting me that he was settled in a small village, in Berkshire I think it was, where he taught reading and writing to ten or a dozen boys at sixpence each, recommending Mrs. T. to my care, and desiring me to write to him directing for Mr. Franklin, schoolmaster, at such a place. He continued to write frequently, sending me large specimens of an epic poem which he was then composing, and desiring my remarks and corrections. These I gave him from time to time, but endeavored rather to discourage his proceeding. One of Young's satires was then just published. I copied and sent him a great part of it, which set in a strong light the folly of pursuing the muses with any hope of advancement by them. All was in vain. Sheets of the poem continued to come by every post. In the meantime, Mrs. T., having on his account lost her friends and business, was often in distresses, and used to send for me, and borrow what I could spare to help her out of them. I grew fond of her company, and, being at that time under no religious restraint, and presuming upon my importance to her, I attempted familiarities, another erratum, which she repulsed with a proper resentment, and acquainted him with my behavior. This made a breach between us, and, when he returned to London, he let me know he thought I had cancelled all the obligations he had been under to me so I found I was never to expect him repaying me what I lent to him or advanced for him. This, however, was not then of much consequence, as he was totally unable, and in the loss of his friendship I found myself relieved from another burden. I now began to think of getting a little money beforehand and expecting better work. I left Palmer's to work at Watts, a still greater printing house. Here I continued all the rest of my stay in London. At my first admission into this printing house, I took to working at press, imagining I felt a want of the bodily exercise I had been used to in America, where press work is mixed with composing. I drank only water. The other workmen, near fifty in number, were great guzzlers of beer. On occasion, I carried up and downstairs a large form of types in each hand, when others carried but one in both hands. They wondered to see, from this and several instances, that the water American, as they called me, was stronger than themselves who drank strong beer. We had an alehouse boy who attended always in the house to supply the workmen. My companion at the press drank every day a pint before breakfast, a pint at breakfast with his bread and cheese, a pint between breakfast and dinner, a pint at dinner, a pint in the afternoon about six o'clock, and another when he had done his day's work. I thought it a detestable custom, 
but it was necessary, he supposed, to drink strong beer, that he might be strong to labor.' 